much for having, having me again here at the church. Uh, it's a great privilege. Sorry. It's a great, great privilege for me to be here once again. We are going to look at Romans chapter 5 from verse 1. So you can turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 5 from verse 1. For those who don't know me, maybe visit this. I'm, my name is Nico Fansal. I'm one of the pastors at Birchley Baptist Church here, here in Kempton Park. Right, so before we come to the text, let's, let's pray again. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Romans. Father, we pray that you will give us a thirst and a hunger to, to know more of you through your word. Father, help us to, to meditate on your word day and night. And Father, we, we pray that you would help us now to understand this passage. Help me as I preach your word, Father. May Christ be glorified and may we know, Father, what blessings we can have in Christ. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, we're going to look at Romans chapter 5 from verse 1. I'm reading from the ESV Bible. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows His love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the Word of God. The title of this, more, uh, this afternoon's message is Boast in God and His benefits. Boast in God and in His benefits. Now it comes across in many churches when you visit them across Africa. It's been my privilege through African pastors' conferences to visit many churches that not only in Africa but in Asia, in, um, in the USA, many people have misunderstood the meaning and the benefits of the gospel. What we see in many churches is the high priority pastors place on a so-called deliverance and healing ministry. Maybe you have come aware of that. I'm, I'm not, I don't think that happens in this church. But in many churches, that is a high priority. That's the highlight of the service is a deliverance and, and, and a healing ministry. The emphasis is being placed on the gospel and of Christ um, and that He came to deliver us in these churches now from all sicknesses and all kinds of suffering. That's the emphasis. And so if you have sin that you are struggling with, or you have sickness, you have pain in your body, it is God's plan, they would say, that God would want to remove that suffering, move that pain, remove that uh, you know, difficulty in your life. That is the gospel. So the emphasis in those churches is that God came through the gospel, to deliver you now in this life from all kinds of pain and suffering. Um, but when we read the gospels and we read the book of Romans, especially chapter 5 and chapter 8, we get a different picture. Because Paul, you will see, as we just read now, read now uh, paints a different picture. Because, as you see, he rejoices in suffering. 
And you see in chapter 8 as well, he talks about the suffering that we will have to go through in this life. Um, many people and many churches would say that um, to, in order to retain the favor of God in your life, you have to go through these deliverance sessions uh, where, where the demons of lust and religion and alcohol and loneliness and pornography and pride, whatever things that trouble is, troubles you, those things must be cast out, cast out of your life. There are demons that are troubling you. Uh, so the, the emphasis is then on, uh, on a pain-free, carefree, trouble-free, tribulation-free life in, in this life. But what we see in this passage is not, is, not this, is, is not what we actually see in the gospel. Last time when I preached here, I looked at uh, the, the, the topic of justification. And we looked at the fact that God justifies us freely by His grace through Jesus Christ. And we are, we are, we are made righteous in the sight of God through the redemption that is in Christ. Through, through His righteousness that is imputed to us by faith alone. And therefore we stand righteous in the sight of God, not by things that we have done, but by, but by what Christ had done uh, through His life and through His death. So this passage also touches on justification, but also it talks about, uh, Paul talks about re uh, reconciliation and also sanctification, what we see in chapter 5. So, so first, before we get into the text, I just want to make... Uh, mention a few uh, differences between these three terms. And I think it's important for us to understand the difference between justification, uh, reconciliation, and sanctification. In justification, the believer is declared to be a righteous person on the basis of what Christ has done. It is a declaration of God that the believer in Christ is a righteous person in His sight. In reconciliation, uh, the believer becomes becomes a friend of God. He's reconciled to God. There was, a, there, there was hostility between us and God, and now we are reconciled to God. The enmity is gone. In sanctification, we are made like Christ. We become more like Jesus in our character. In justific justification, it's a once-off act, never to be repeated. Once you are justified in the sight of God because of what Christ had done through faith, you're always justified. It, it's not a repeated act. Justification is a once-off declaration. And reconciliation is also instantaneous. When you, are recon when you are justified, you are reconciled to God. It happens at the same time. But in reconciliation, there are also subjective aspects to it, as we'll see in this text. Um, in sanctification, it's not a once-off act, it's a process. While we are gradually, as believers, become more like Jesus. Uh, we, are, we are saved from the from the power and the pollution of sin gradually throughout our whole lives. So justification is a work that happens outside of us. God declares us to be, to be just in His sight. And reconciliation is also something that happened outside of us when Jesus died on the cross, but it brings us into communion with God. We, are, we, become, we become the friends of God because of that. And then in sanctification, it's an inward work gradually where we become like Jesus Christ. So in this message, I want to focus on the benefits of the gospel and Christ's righteousness. And also we'll see then on, on the basis. Uh, what is the basis of, of these benefits that come to us? So <clears throat> what is important for the believer is this. When we experience tribulation and suffering, or we struggle with sin, it, it doesn't mean God's favor is not on your life. And this is the thing that we have to understand. And many people get that wrong. When the believer in Christ suffers, experience loss, struggle with sin, it doesn't mean automatically you're unjustified, you're not reconciled with God, God is angry with you, and you have to go through some kind of deliverance session to, 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 get, to get help. That's not, and this is what, this, this passage makes clear, and I will, I will show you as we go from verse to verse. The so first point is the objective outworkings of the gospel. So let's look, look at verse 1. Verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, 
We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So verse 1 he starts, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, that's the first objective benefit we have in salvation. We are declared to be just. That's my last message. When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, not by works that we have done, but by what Christ had done, we stand righteous in the sight of God. Christ's righteousness has been imputed to us. It counts as ours, and our sins were counted as Christ. He died for it. The penalty was paid. And when we believe on Christ, Christ looks at us as if we have never sinned. And He declares us to be a just person. That's what happens when you believe in Jesus. God looks at you as if you have never sinned. And He declares you to be a righteous person as if you are Jesus Christ. That that is the status we have as believers. God reckons us as justified people. And that's the only reason why anyone will enter heaven. Because Christ's righteousness counts as yours. His perfect obedience to the law of God and the Father. It counts as yours. So you are, you are reckoned to be a, a righteous person. That's what happens in justification. So Paul starts here in verse 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so when you are justified, you have peace with God. And that means you have been reconciled to God. You have, you, you have, you have been brought near. God has declared you to be just because of faith in Jesus Christ, not because of your works. And because you are declared to be a just person, He brings you into communion with God. Um, you are reconciled to God. And that happened when Jesus Christ died at the cross 2,000 years ago. That's what happens. Uh, is also meant by the term atonement. When Jesus died, He made atonement for sin. And that word atonement literally means to be at one with. You're at one with God because of what Christ had done. That's what happened. When, we, when Jesus died, He made atonement for sins. He reconciled us to the Father. Therefore, we are now at one with God. The wrath of God is gone. Our sins are removed. And now we're at one with God. So that, that is something that has happened 2,000 years ago. God reconciled the world to Himself uh, 2,000 years ago. That happened at the cross. And that is an objective reality um, that comes to the believer in Christ. Therefore, He says, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 2, Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So the third blessing, objective blessing, is access to the throne of God. Access. Um, now, to understand that, that terminology, we have to think about a king in the ancient Near East. If you know the Bible, you know the Persian Empire when Esther was a princess. She couldn't just go and appear before the king. She had, she had to have permission, special permission. And that, that's how it worked in the ancient Near East. You cannot just go into a king's court and appear before him. Even Solomon was the same. You see it in the Old Testament. He, the, the, even um, the sons of Solomon cannot just appear before the king for any old reason. And, and, and in the Old Testament, you also get that idea. Nobody could just come into God's presence at any time. Only the high priest, once a year, could go into the most holy place. There was a veil between the holy and the most holy place. And only once a year, when there was offerings being made and, and the blood was being uh, poured out on the mercy seat, it's the only, only person who can access God's presence was the high priest. Now what is Paul saying here? Verse 2 he says, Through Christ, through the death of Christ, the believer has access to the presence of God. It's an objective thing. Yes, God, God has made the way through Jesus Christ that died on the cross. You as a believer has the privilege to enter God's most holy place. Like the high priest, you have that 
privilege. When Jesus died on the cross, remember, the veil was torn in two in the temple. Remember that? He was torn in two, showing that for every believer you have access to the throne of God. So, so this is the grace that we have. We are justified. We are reconciled to God. We have access to the most holy place. So that's the first thing I want to say. So there are objective blessings. Yes, we are reconciled. We are, we are, we are justified. We have, we have the right to enter the most holy place, which is a wonderful privilege. Now also, now secondly, there are subjective benefits. From verse 1 to verse 5, Paul lists five things that the believer has in his, can experience in his life. Firstly, inward peace. Romans 5, chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have been reconciled to God, but because we are reconciled to God, we have peace with God. We have actual, it's an experience. Why do I say that? You see in verse 5, all these blessings come through the Holy Spirit. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the, you can say the Holy Spirit invades your life. <laughs> he, he makes His home within you. And, and then you, you experience the peace of God. Uh, and you know that your sins are forgiven. You, and you, you, it's an experience because when the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life, you know about it. It's not like you, you, you're unaware of it. When, when God comes into your life, you have peace. You know your sins are forgiven. That's what Paul is talking about here. Also in his, others let, in, in his other letters, he talks about the peace that surpasses all understanding. Philippians chapter 4. John chapter 14, verse 20, 27, Jesus said, Jesus said to his disciples, My peace I give you. Not the peace that the world gives you. My peace I give you. And this is what we experience when, when we come to Jesus Christ. And that peace... Um, is God's peace and you don't have to fast and pray to, to have that peace you don't have to confess all your sins to a priest to have that peace you don't have to give the pastor money to, 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 give, to get that peace all, those, all of that peace comes to us through faith in, in Jesus Christ that is the result and benefit of the gospel then verse 2 goes on and it says through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So the next subjective benefit of the gospel is joy. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we don't rejoice because we are rich. We don't rejoice because everything is going well in our life. There's no suffering. There's no tribulation. There's, there's nothing wrong in our life. That's not why we rejoice. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Because when Jesus came to this earth, He paid our debt and He rose from the dead so that those who believe have what? Eternal life. So where is our hope? Not that we're going to have mansions on earth, that we're going to be rich in this world, that we're going to have never pain in this life, no sickness, no suffering, no tribulation. No. Our, our joy is in, in the gospel and that we're going to be with God in glory. That's why he says, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That is what Christ came for. To give us an inheritance. Glory. Now the, the word in Greek there for, 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 for rejoice is actually boast. Boast. So in other words, you're boasting. You're boasting about the glory of God. He says, actually, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. We, we tell others about it. We're boasting that Jesus Christ died for us to, to give us a place in heaven. He's preparing a place in heaven for us in glory. So that is what comes to us through the gospel. He says, we rejoice or we boast in the hope of the glory of God. But now in verse 3, it gets interesting because... Uh, verse 3 says, and the same word is actually used in the Greek, we boast in our sufferings. That's what Paul says. We boast in our sufferings. And that, that, that's, that's not how humans usually, that's not really what we do. When we experience suffering, tribulation, sickness, pain in our body, what do we do? We complain. 
Why is this happening to me? Well, why am I going through this? Why, why, why is God allowing these things to happen in my life? But that's not what Paul is saying, is it? He? he says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing. And this is not just, it's not a, it's not a masochist that just delights in pain. You know, you get people like that. Just enjoy pain. Just like to inflict pain on themselves. But that they are mentally disturbed, right? You think. They, they are mentally disturbed. People like pain. They're, they're not actually mentally right. People will cut themselves and, and so on. But that's what Paul is not a masochist. He's not, he's, he's not enjoying suffering for suffering's sake. He's not, he's, he's not enjoying it. He's, in, he's, he's rejoicing in sufferings because of what it produces. Because that's, that's what he says. We rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. You see, so that's why when Paul was in prison and Silas and the people beat them, they were singing songs. They were singing songs. They were praising God in their suffering. Now that is not, that's counterintuitive. We don't think like that. But that's what Paul says. He says, we rejoice in suffering. Why? Because it produces endurance and endurance produces character. So what does suffering then do for the Christian? In, in, in simple terms, it draws you closer to God, away from the world, and it makes you more like Jesus. That's what happens. When you experience pain, and when you experience suffering, you pray. You pray to God, help me. Help me. Comfort me. Help me in this suffering that I'm going through. That is what pain does. It weans you, weans you from the world. It brings you closer to God. And then God pours Himself into your life. It makes you more like Jesus. And that is what Paul says. He said it in Philippians chapter 3 as well. All our wishes to know God, to, the, to know the power of His resurrection, to have fellowship with His sufferings. You think, Paul, are you mad? Why do you want suffering? Because suffering makes me like Jesus. That's why. That's why he rejoices. He boasts in suffering. Because it makes him like Jesus. We don't think like that as believers. And when suffering comes... We complain. Why is this happening to me? So Paul, now Paul is, now this, this is what you have to get. Suffering makes you more like Jesus. So many times in the believer's life, God will not take your suffering away. God will not take your pain away. He will not. He will, he will, he will keep you in that situation because in that situation, you become like Jesus. That is His purpose. Through suffering comes endurance. Through endurance comes uh, character. And through character comes hope, uh, Paul says. It's like, it's like, if I can use the analogy, it's like somebody flying on a helicopter. Flying in a helicopter. He's there in a helicopter. He sees the beautiful landscape. He's, he's at peace. But let's say something happens to the helicopter and, he, and there's a rope and you have to hang on the rope. When he has to take that rope and he hangs on the helicopter, he is holding for dear life that he won't fall. He knows life and death is now at stake. That tribulation is causing him to hold on for dear life, right? For dear life. And that's exactly what happens. When you go through suffering, you hold on to God for your whole life. God, help me in this situation. Make me more life. Save me from my sin, from my corruption. And that's why God pushes us through that difficult times. They say that diamonds are made through pressure, right? If you, if you know something about how diamonds are formed in the, in, the, in, the, in the crust of the earth, it's through pressure that diamonds are formed, right? And it's the same with us. It's through the pressures of life that we become like Jesus Christ. Therefore, when suffering comes your way, rejoice in God. Because God is Weaning you from the world and drawing you to Himself. That's what Paul is saying here. And that is a blessing. And so, so people that preach, no, that pain that you have must get rid of that pain. No, sometimes God wants you to experience pain because He's drawing you to Himself and He's making you more like Jesus. So that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, we rejoice in suffering because suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces 
character. And character produces hope. When you're in that situation, you hope. You hope that God will one day deliver you from this body of death, this body of sin. It produces hope. Because God has promised a day will come in righteousness and where He will change your body to be like a glorified body. You will experience no pain, no suffering, no sickness. You will be in glory in heaven, never to sin again. So that, that suffering produces eventually that hope, the hope of heaven. And then verse 5, And hope does not put to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. It is through suffering many times we draw the closest to God. We experience the love of God. The nearness of God. I always, maybe I've said it this, in this uh, congregation, I don't know. Richard Wurmbrand always comes to mind. He wrote the book, Tortured for Christ. He was 14 years in jail, three years in Romania, and solitary confinement under the earth. Never saw the sun. Never saw the sun. They beat him on his back, on his feet. He couldn't walk when he came out of prison. But while he was there in prison for three years, alone, never saw anybody, they just gave him food to live. He said God's presence was so tangible. It was the best times of his life while he was suffering. And God's love, that's what happens. When we suffer for Jesus, God draws near. And the love of God is poured into our hearts. And therefore Paul can say, I rejoice in suffering because it draws me closer to God. And all these blessings, peace, joy, hope, love, comes to us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's what he says. The love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that is given to us. That is what he's saying. And that, those are the benefits of the gospel. The suffering is one of the benefits. The others as well. Um, that's what Paul is saying here. So there are objective and subjective benefits. Verse 6. Now we come to, from verse 6 to 8. He gives us the ground. What is the basis of all of this? What is the basis? He says, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the godly. That word, right time, time is not chronos, it's kairos. At an appointed time, in, in the fullness of time, God sent Jesus Christ in the world. While you were weak, while you were helpless, the literal word there is helpless. You were like a baby. You couldn't help yourself. You know a baby? Utterly dependent on the mother, right? Utterly. The baby cannot feed itself, cannot care for itself. That's how we were. Utterly helpless. Couldn't save ourselves. And when we were utterly helpless, Christ at the appointed time uh, came and He died for the ungodly. That is you, and that is me. When we were ungodly. At the right time. That is the basis. Why all these blessings are coming to us. Is because God sent His Son while we were helpless, ungodly, the enemies of God. The enemies of God, hostile towards God. God sent Jesus Christ to die for us. That is the reason why all these blessings, any blessing, any spiritual blessing you have, any blessing comes to you because Jesus died. He died on the cross 2,000 years ago. And then verse 7, the other the other ground for all these blessings is the love of God. Verse 7 and verse 8. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Through, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, so Christ did not come to save good people. He, while we were still sinners... He says, yes, scarcely someone will die for a righteous person. That's somebody who is who's given to do always the right thing. The right is always very particular, doing everything right in society. Or a good person. One, one, one would be uh, maybe, uh, you know, inclined to help a good person. Somebody who's generous, who good, does good to others. Uh, you think of, of people like soldiers who lay down their life to defend a country, right? They, they, they're laying down their lives. They're willing to die for, for, for the population. But you know, what, what, what makes the love of God so magnificent is that none of us were good. None of us were good. Like Romans chapter 3 says, none is righteous, not, 
Not even one. There's no one that is good. Not even one. God, Jesus Christ didn't come to die for, for good people, righteous people. He came to die for sinners. And like we, like we were at our worst, there was nothing in us to love. But God showed His love for us. That while we were the enemies of God, Christ died for us. It's like, to, sh to use another analogy, it is like, it might sound a bit gruesome, excuse the analogy, but you will get the point. It is like you have a family gathering, and the thieves come, and let's say your whole family is there. And they kill all the men, they rape all the women, and you are the only one left. And they, they catch the criminals. And there's, a, there's a court hearing, and they are found guilty. They're sentenced for life. And they go to jail, right? There's something horrible just happened to you. Horrible. And then, for some reason, in this analogy, um, you would say, there's a ransom. You can pay the judge two million dollars, or whatever it is. And, you, and if the ransom is paid, they can, they can be freed. And that's what you do. You decide to do that. You take those criminals. You bring them into your house. You give them the family name and the inheritance. That sounds bizarre, isn't it? it sounds bizarre. Who would do something like that? God did. We were the enemies of God. We were God haters. We were idolaters. And God sent His Son and died for us. And He brought the criminal into the house. He forgave His debt by faith. He brings him into the house. He gives him a family name. He gives him an inheritance. That's what happens in the gospel. We were not good people. We were the enemies of God. And the immensity of God's love is this. While we were the ungodly, the enemies of God, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And that's why these blessings come. That's, that's why the love of God is so great. That's the basis. Why all these blessings come to us. Justification, reconciliation, peace, joy, hope, all these things. And then verse 9 and 10 says, Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. For if while we were the enemies, we were reconciled by God to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. Now you must get the argument here. Paul is arguing, is drawing an inference, and, make, and is arguing from the greater work to the lesser work. <coughs> He's basically saying this. If God justified and reconciled you while you were a God-hater, while you were an idolater, when, when there was nothing in you to love, if God did that when you were at your worst, how much more will He do the lesser work of saving you from coming wrath and, and sanctifying you in this life, through His life? That's the greater work. If He has done that, if He has done the greater thing by sending His Son while you were an enemy of God, how much more will He save you in this life? Will He sanctify you and bring you to glory while you're, now his, while you're His friend, while you're justified and reconciled to God? It's like this. If, if somebody here has run the Comrades Marathon, is there anybody like that? Anybody run the com Comrades here? Nobody? Okay. You know the comrades, right? If you have run the comrades, what is a park, five kilometer park run, right? What is that? It's nothing. I, 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 it's easy, right? If I do comrades year by year, I'm going to do a park run easily. Let's say another analogy. If you can bench press 100 kg, uh, 100 kilograms, 100, uh, uh, 100 kgs, bench press, you know, in the gym, bench press. How easy is it to do 10, 10, 10 kgs, right? 10 kgs is nothing. And this is the argument Paul is making here. He's saying this. If, if Christ died for you while you were ungodly, while you were a sinner, while we were at your worst, when He justified you and reconciled you, while you were at your worst, He will most assuredly save you from coming wrath. He will. You can have confidence 
Okay, that's what he's saying. If he has reconciled you while you were an enemy of God, he will most assuredly sanctify you and save you in this life. He will do the work. Those whom he justified, he will glorify. Romans chapter 8.30. He will do it. So what is Paul saying here? You can be assured of your salvation. You believe in Jesus Christ. You must have confidence that if you believe in Jesus Christ, He will most assuredly finish His work. He will do it. So that, that means justification and reconciliation to God is an irreversible act. Once you are justified, you are always justified. The favor of God will never leave you. Never. With the favor of God is upon you by grace. It is always upon you. It doesn't mean God will not discipline you. It doesn't mean you won't struggle with sin. Yes, when we do struggle with sin. Yes, we do go through difficult times. It doesn't mean God's favor is not upon your life. It doesn't mean that. And therefore, you don't have to go to a deliverance. You know, uh, somebody who casts out demons. For every problem, every pain that you have, and every sickness that you may have, and even if you get cancer, God's favor is still upon your life. Because He's done the greater work already. That is the point that Paul is making here. That is the point he's making. Christ will never leave His people. That we are not saying, I'm not saying in any way we can do whatever we like. We can sin as we want. Now that's not what Paul is saying here. He's, that's, not, that's the next chapter, chapter 6. If we died with Him, we should live with Him, right? If, how shall we continue in sin if, 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 we, if, you know, if, if Christ died for us? We shall not continue in sin. And what Paul is making is, the believer in Jesus Christ can have assurance of salvation. Because Christ already did the greater work. And dying for us while we were at our worst. That is his point. And finally, verse 11 now, he's actually now coming to his, the greatest point that he's actually making. More than that, more than everything that he's just said, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received the reconciliation. So what is he saying here? You know what the greatest thing is? It's not all the blessings of God. Great as they are, the greatest thing is God himself. God himself. Rejoice in God. Boast in God. Because all these blessings, Jesus died so that He can bring you to God. So that you can enjoy God forever. That is the greatest blessing of all. He died, he, he died on the cross, yes, to bring you to God so that you can have eternal fellowship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He, he died to bring you into His presence. John Piper wrote a book, God is the Gospel. Very good book. I read it many, many years ago. I read it more than once. And he, he makes the point. And I quote, Justification is not an end in itself. Neither is the forgiveness of sins or the imputation of righteousness. Neither is escape from hell or entrance into heaven or freedom from disease or liberation from bondage or eternal life or justice or mercy or the beauties of a pain-free world. None of these facets of the gospel diamond is the chief good or the highest goal of the gospel. Only one thing is, seeing and savoring God Himself. All those blessings are not blessing unless it brings you to God. God, heaven will not be heaven unless God is there. That is the greatest good of the gospel. Being, being like God, ch being changed into image, seeing His face, experiencing His presence. And Paul is saying here, more than all these blessings, more than that, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have the reconciliation. And therefore, I want to, I want to, I want to uh, encourage you as a believer, boast in God. Boast in the benefits of God. Yes, the benefits of God. Yes, all these things that we've just said. But more than that, boast in God. Make God your boast in life and in death. May God help us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this text. We thank you that you give us great encouragement and assurance. Father, that if you've 
If you've sent Jesus Christ while we were at our worst, how much more will you complete the work of salvation and save us from all our sins and sanctify us and save us from future wrath when the judgment comes? Thank you, Father, for the gospel. Thank you that we are justified by grace through faith. We are reconciled by grace through faith. And that we are sanctified by grace through faith. Thank you, Father, that you have given your Son as a sacrifice while we were yet ungodly sinners and the enemies, your enemies. Thank you, Father. We pray, Father, that we will boast this week, the coming week, in God and in His benefits. We pray, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.